Good evening once again, depending on the part of the world where you are uh, connected from. My name is Salami Olusha, so as uh, fondly introduced. I've been in the field of cybersecurity for quite some time now. Uh, I've been in the field for over 15 years. I practice as a cybersecurity consultant or analyst and also as a trainer. Back then in my home country, Nigeria, and now in UK. So today we'll be taking a look at data privacy in cloud computing, threat and countermeasures. That is the webinar before us so that we can have a detailed knowledge of why we need to have privacy within the cloud. And um, before we even talk about the cloud, there are things we need to know about the cloud computing. We need to understand the very basic uh, definition of cloud computing, understand the deployment model, also understand the service categories and what organizations should do before uh, they adopt the cloud strategy. Sometimes when organizations adopt the cloud, uh, they might not do due diligence. And as a result of that, they can get their fingers burned. So we're going to examine all that really? in the one and a half hours uh, webinar section. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if you have a question, if you have a question, you can make your question known through the chat box or through the moderator. So what is data privacy? Looking at this compound sentence, data privacy in cloud computing, threat and countermeasures. There are two words within this phrase, data privacy, that's one. We have data privacy, that's on one side, and we have cloud computing. So we're going to examine first cloud computing, then how do we now protect our data within the cloud environment? First, what is a cloud computing? If you ask some people to define cloud computing, some will tell you, well, cloud computing refers to deployment of computing resources via the internet. There are so many definitions of cloud computing globally, but the most acceptable definition is the definition from the National Institute of Standard and Technology that we call the NIST definition. Within this NIST definition, we are going to look at the characteristics of cloud computing, the service model of cloud computing, and also the deployment model. So based on the NIST definition, cloud computing is a model. When we talk about a model, a model means a guide, a template, a reference, for enabling ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand network access to a share pool of configurable computing resources. Now, when we talk about ubiquitous, it means that cloud computing is such that something that is time decoupled and location decoupled, you can access it anywhere in the world and from any location. Unlike your on-premises um, computing environment where is restricted to the enterprise environment. In cloud computing, you can access it from any part of the globe and you can access your resources anytime. So it is location decoupled and it is time decoupled. You can have access to 47 without any glitches, without any sign of being any latency or any sign of the system being down. Three, on-demand network access. On-demand means that the consumer is given the provision or the privileges or the power to deploy these cloud resources as when needed. So it means that when you compare the cloud environment with the on-premises, you know in the on-premises, you need to make some um, purchase ahead of time. You go through procurement, the procurement department, you make some uh, upfront and um, payment. So example, you have a project at hand and the project based on your analysis, you decided that you need about four or five servers. So you buy the servers ahead of the project and uh, maybe the project will only last for two years. At the end of the two years, the servers become redundant. But in cloud environments, you don't need to provision any resources ahead of time. All you need to do is that you provision the resources when those resources are actually needed. You pay for what you need. You pay for what you consume. The payment plan of the cloud environment makes it so attractive for most organizations to want to adopt the cloud 
either as a test, uh, maybe to have a test environment to test a new technology, or maybe to have their DR sites in the cloud, instead of having their DR sites on, on another location through hot sites or cold sites or warm sites or whichever DR model, recovery model you want to adopt. But when you use the cloud environment, you're using the cloud environment as a DR solution. You only pay for what you consume. You don't uh, make any unnecessary payment. So these resources can be provisioned and released with minimal management effort, which means that, example, if I want to provision Azure, uh, maybe Azure resources, Microsoft resources on Azure platform, I don't need to start discussing with Microsoft. All I need to do is to make sure I have an account with Microsoft. And once I have an account, I can provision these resources without the interaction of the service provider. In this case, the service providers is Microsoft. So I don't need all that there. Now, having said so, okay, so I will advise the delegate. Yeah, you are. We are getting connect. you clearly, sir. Okay, thank you. You are okay. excellently, okay. absolutely perfect. All right, thank you so much. So that yeah, delegate, you. please, um, maybe they will share the recorded section with you. You can go by again, then you can ask questions when the time comes. So as I was saying, when you want to make provisions of any resources on the cloud, you don't need the intervention or interaction with the service providers. All you need to do, a case study of Azure, you need to have an account on Microsoft platform, Azure platform, deploy your resources. So these resources can be deployed on demand. When you need those resources, you can deploy it. You don't need to provision resource side of time and you don't need to over provision resources. Sometimes when we want to launch a new project, uh, you know, there are two things we normally do before we launch any application, any project. We do two tests. We do the UAT test, which is the user acceptance testing. I will do the QAT test, which is the quality uh, assurance testing. Now, for the UAT, your focus is always on the functionality. We look at what the stakeholders have said, the functions they want, the features they want in those applications. Then when we are now deploying, when we are testing, we are testing those applications to be sure that all the requirements from the stakeholders are actually fulfilled in that application. That's the essence of the UAT. But you agree with me that the number of people that comes up in the UAT might not even be those people that are part of the requirement analysis. So when you now deploy the application, at peak hours, the application can crash due to the fact that the application might not be able to accommodate certain number of users or certain number of volumes of record. But in the cloud environment, that is not so. You can scale resources at will what was the demand when you have a sparks in the network? That is when the number of concurrent users increases. You can configure a scale up policy that when the number of users increases, then the system should automatically provision additional resources to accommodate those sparks in your demand. And if the volume of record increases, you can also configure your scaling policy to accommodate those demand. So within the uh, webinar, we'll be looking at three good qualities of this definition. We'll take a look at the characteristics of a cloud, what makes the cloud computing actually different from the on-premises um, IT infrastructure. Then we'll take a look at the service model and also consider the deployment model. So when we establish this basic fact, we can now go on and talk about the data privacy in the cloud environment. So what are the key features, characteristics of cloud. Number one, on-demand self-service. In the on-demand self-service, this is where the cloud customers can provision services in an automatic manner. So you can provision services. If I need 10 servers, I can provision them without the intervention or interaction with the cloud service providers. All I need to do is to have an account, then I also specify my payment plan. Maybe the payment plan should be pay as you go, or I want to take advantage of some cost optimization options in the cloud because within the cloud, despite the fact that it is pay as you go model, 
There are also some other cost optimization options you can use to further reduce your cost in provisioning resources within the cloud. So on-demand self-service does not require procurement. You don't need to go through the lengthy procurement, sending requests for proposal, requests for information. You don't need to go through all that. All those ones are necessary when you are deploying your own premises, but within the cloud, all the bureaucracy of procurement, provisioning approval from finance and others, they are actually eliminated. All you need to do is to have a payment uh, methods, maybe your credit card or whichever methods you want to use to make payments and you provision these resources. Number two, we have the broad network access. All cloud services and components are usually accessible over the net, uh, over the network. And that's why we define cloud computing to be the deployment of computing resources over the internet or over the network. Example, most of us, if not all, we have a private email address. The private email address could be maybe your Yahoo or Gmail or Hotmail or whichever other mail you have. Now, these this are classical example of cloud computing. Those days, you know, we want to have a mail service. We normally deploy our exchange servers on premises, but with the cloud environment, we don't need all those ones. And uh, when you even deploy your mail servers within the on-premises network, you know, accessibility becomes an issue, especially in developing countries, Africa as a focus and other third world countries, you see that power is a major issue. Now, how do you ensure that the power availability is there for 24 hours where you can access these um, uh, mail servers remotely? But with the cloud environment, you can be anywhere, you can access your mail anytime, anywhere, because it is time and location decoupled. Those are the features of cloud computing. Now, another feature is resource pooling. So when you want to scale up your resources or when you provision resources within the cloud environment, the cloud service provider, it is their responsibility to aggregate all their resources to ensure that the resources you have deployed becomes operational in the cloud environment. Number three, we have rapid elasticity. The rapid elasticity allows you to scale up your resources either vertically or horizontally as your demand increases. So we don't need to provision all the provision resources. We can provision minimal resources and then have a scaling policy that when the need for those resources increases, especially at peak hours, those resources, or techno C118, yes, I'm with scale you. Up, scale up vertically versus horizontally, what does it mean? Okay. Now, when you scale up resources vertically, it simply means you're upgrading that resource. For example, within the cloud environment, if I want to scale up vertically, let's assume that I have a virtual machine. We call it virtual machine in, uh, in the case of Azure. For AWS, we call it EC2, Elastic Compute, um, EC2, just see it as EC2 but Azure, we call it um, virtual machine. Now, if I want to scale up my virtual machine vertically, maybe initially the uh, configuration of the virtual machine is such that the RAM size is 16 gig and the processor is maybe um, dual core or let's say the processor has a certain speed, maybe Intel base, maybe 2.4 gigahertz. Now I want to scale this hub so that it becomes a high performing system. The, what I'll do is that I'll increase the RAM size to about 64, that is scaling up. When you upgrade those um, resources, your virtual machine, that's the scale up so that the virtual machine can have higher computing capability, that's the scale up. But in horizontal scaling, that's vertical scaling rather. In horizontal scaling, this is where you are adding more virtual machines. Example, you have provisioned your servers. You, maybe you provision two servers to handle the workload. And you now put a scaling policy that once the workload increases, you want additional servers to be provisioned. And the metrics you can use in most cases is that if you observe, you put a scaling policy that 
once the CPU utilization is above 75%, please increase by provisioning additional virtual machine. The virtual machine in this instance are your servers. So within the context of our job, virtual machine refers to as the servers. Those servers you call in the on-premises network. So on-premises, we call it servers. Within that job, we call it virtual machine. So you can say once it gets to CPU utilization of 75%, please increase the uh, virtual machine by one instance or by two instance. Now, this scaling up is done rapidly. If your demand decreases, maybe uh, off peak, the demand down decreases and the CPU utilization now decreases to about 25%, then you can say it should scale down. You can say that the system should scale down by removing some of those virtual machines. This is to enable you not to over provision resources and also to handle sparks and give you a cost optimization uh, methods. Then we have our measured service. One of the benefits of cloud computing is that you only pay for what you consume. Cloud services are delivered and built in a meter way, the same way you pay for your utility. For those of us that have prepared meter or that we have a meter bill, a water uh, meet, uh, bill that we use or gas bill that we pay, we monitor it, we see our consumption, the same thing you do in cloud computing. Cloud computing has been reduced to become a kind of utility where you just pay for what you consume. So you don't need to pay for over, uh, over provision any resources. You pay for what you've consumed. That's one of the benefits and advantage of cloud computing. Now, having taken a look at that, um, now let's take a look at the cloud service categories. Because when we talk about these cloud service categories, they come in different forms. The cloud service categories comes in different forms. And when we talk about cloud service categories, we're referring to the way the services <clears throat> are being grouped together. So within this cloud service categories, we'll be looking at number one, infrastructure as a service, number two, platform as a service, and the third one, software as a service. Uh, let me just quickly mute someone uh, because of interference. All right. So we'll be looking at infrastructure as a service, the platform as a service, and then the software as a service. Now, based on the NIST definition, by NIST definition, I'm referring to National Institute of Standard and Technology definition. Like I told you, there are so many definitions around cloud computing, but the best and adopted definition, which has become the de facto standard within the industry, has been the definition from the National Institute of Standard and Technology, which we call the NIST definition. Now, based on this NIST definition for infrastructure as a service, this is where the capability provided to the consumer in other words, the consumer is given the capability to provision some computing resources. And these computing resources are the storage, they can provision their network, and they can provision also their database. So when they are, because they are given the capability, it therefore means that I can specify one, I can specify my virtual machines, I can specify my operating system, I can provision my database. I can provision my storage, met, uh, the storage um, method I want to use. I can also provision the type of network I want to use. So this is what we call infrastructure as a service. And when you compare infrastructure as a service with other service model, this is where the consumer is given the most flexibility to provision resources at will. I can provision my server. I can decide to use uh, select my operating system, whether it's going to be server-based, uh, Windows-based, or Linux box. I even within the Windows, I may decide to say I'm going to pick uh, maybe a window data center, or I can pick a client operating system and choose the service model. All this flexibility are possible in infrastructure as a service. And this infrastructure as a service is peculiar in a situation where you want to migrate your on-premises uh, IT infrastructure to the cloud. If you want to replicate your on-premises IT infrastructure to the cloud environment, what you are going to use is infrastructure as a service. 
So we use the infrastructure as a service to replicate all the IT infrastructure we have within our enterprise and we'll push them to the cloud. To do that, you use infrastructure as a service. What are the benefits of this infrastructure as a service? One, usage meter, you know, within the on-premises, we talk about the precision value. So I'm from the accounting point of view, all IT assets, if not, uh, most IT assets, if not all, they have a four years depreciation value. So from the accounting point of view, after four years, those assets will not have any financial value. So you now begin to talk about replacement. And sometimes you talk about the end of life or end of use, where the service provider will no longer provide support for those assets. But within the cloud, you are not losing anything because you are paying as you go, it is pay as you go model. In other words, it is a usage meter and price on basis of unit. So whatever you provision, that is what you pay for. You pay for what you consume. Two, ability to scale up and down infrastructure. You have the flexibility, elasticity, scaling, to scale up resources as the demand uh, arises. And you can also scale down your resources during off-peak by configuring all these in your scaling policy. Three, reduce cost of ownership. You don't need to make provision or buy any assets. There's no need for any capital expenditure. Like we normally have budgets in IT. We say we want to have a budget, we want to provision this, we want to provision that, and the budget will be running to thousands or uh, millions of dollars. We don't need that. All you need to do is to provision resources you need and pay as you use. Unlike the on-premises where there is depreciation and you can have loss of asset value, here there is nothing like loss of asset value, no, depreci no depreciation. It is the responsibility of the cloud service providers to provide all those resources for the consumer to use in the first case. And also your maintenance costs, you know, sometimes within the on-premises, we normally uh, sign up for most of these um, support, either local or remote support, all those things, those costs associated with maintenance and support are totally eliminated within the cloud environment. So notable examples among providers that provide this infrastructure as a service, uh, Amazon, we have AT&T, we have uh, Microsoft, we have Rackspace, we have Teramac, HP, Oracle, all of them. Most of them are big players. So you can also check Gartner's Condrant to see other players, other niche players that are just coming in. But the big four are actually Microsoft, Amazon, Alibaba, and Google. So after the big four, it is others. Those big four are the major, the factor within the industry. Then number two, we have the platform as a service. Now in platform as a service, based on the needs definition, this is where the consumer is given the capability to provision just the customized application. So here, you don't have the flexibility like choosing your operating system, choosing your line platform. The concern here is that you are coming with a mindset of a developer. This is peculiar. This is normally used by developer or software developing company where their focus is to develop applications. So the goal here is to provision your applications to develop uh, you provision them within the cloud environment. So what is the idea here? You are not concerned about the underlying operating system. That will be the responsibility of the cloud service provider. The underlying operating system may be Linux, or may be Windows Boss, the configuration, the maintenance, the update of the underlying infrastructure, they are not your concern. Your concern is your business focus, your business oriented, you focus more on your application, and you provision the application on the cloud um, service providers. So now let's take a look at few benefits of this platform as a service. OS can be changed and upgraded frequently. Why? Because these OS are managed by, okay, I'm going to take this question. Okay, I'll note the question. It says, does saving data on cloud significantly reduce the need for cyber security measures on company? I'm going to take it when I get to the question section, so, but I, I like the way you drop the question, I'm going to take it at that time. So um, as we continue, 
the OS can be changed and upgraded. Why? Because the operating system is being managed by the cloud service provider. They are not the focus of the consumer. The focus of the consumer is just to provision their customized application, especially software developers or software solution company. Two, globally distributed development teams are able to work together on software development projects within the same environment. Now, because the cloud environment is time decoupled and location decoupled, you can access it anytime and you can access it anywhere. So it allows for interoperability among all the development teams. Number three, services are available and can be obtained from diverse sources that cross national and international boundaries. There is no geographical boundaries to cloud computing. The services are available from any region. It is time, time decoupled and location decoupled. So services are always available. The way the cloud is designed is such that the cloud is designed with high availability to ensure that the latency within the cloud is actually reduced to microseconds. Now let's take a look at um, the third one, software as a service. Now in software as a service, we've talked about infrastructure as a service. We've looked at the platform as a service. Now we want to take a look at software as a service. Once again, I did mention that in infrastructure as a service, the consumer has the flexibility to provision resources at will. You are given the opportunity to provision your servers, the choice of operating system, your storage, your database, and also your networking. So you have high uh, flexibility in infrastructure as a service. Within the platform as a service, I did mention that this is ideal for developers or software solution companies. Whereas infrastructure as a service is ideal when you want to migrate your on-premises um, infrastructure to the cloud environment. Now in software as a service, this is where the consumer does not provision any resources within the cloud environment, but rather the consumer is given the capability to use the resources provided by the cloud service providers. Example of this is the Zoom platform. Zoom is a classical example of software as a service. Now, when you want to use Zoom, all you need to do is to pay for subscription. You are not doing any other thing. You are not the one that designed the application. So all you need to do is to assess it from your various client devices, either through a thin client interface, such as a web browser or a program interface. So your Zoom, your um, Google Meets, all those are examples of um, software as a service and others that you can find within the market that is used for um, collaboration, especially for meeting purpose. Uh, so all those team, um, your Microsoft Teams, those are examples of um, software as a service. And you also have Salesforce. There are software as a service. Uh, those are, there's too many software as a service depending on the application you're looking for. So what are the benefits of this software as a service? Overall reduction of costs, because the cloud deployment reduces the need for advanced hardware to deploy on the client side. I don't, you don't deploy anything. I remember those days when we uh, when collaboration first came out, the likes of Polycon, the hardware devices, you spend millions. When my company deployed then, I was with the oil servicing firm, millions to deploy Polycon, the hardware devices, the conference room, and everything, millions. But if you take a look at Zoom now, all you need to do, you specify which of the product um, you want to go for, maybe it's the business, and you also specify the number of concurrent users you want to have. If you want to have maybe more than 500 concurrent users that connects to it. So that would determine the amount you pay. And that's all, that's the only, uh, that's, that's the only cost you, you incur. Others, people can connect to it from anywhere. So application and software licensing, this is no longer needed because these are the responsibility of the cloud service providers. You don't need to purchase any license. You don't need to pay for any support. They are responsibility of the cloud service providers. And reduce support costs. Consumers save money on support issues 
because those are just the responsibility of the cloud service providers. So they are no longer the business of the cloud consumer. Now let's take a look at some of the other benefits. Ease of use and limited administration. You get automatic update and patch management. All these are responsibilities of the cloud service providers. They are no longer the concerns of the consumer. Standardization and compatibility. All users that um, are using it, they have the same version of the software release. So, and it also gives you global accessibility. You can access it from anywhere, any part in the world, time and location decoupled. And if you look at some of these application, notable applications that are used within the workforce, like um, your Salesforce, all of them are classical examples of um, software as a service. Even the Sage, that is one of the most popular um, accounting software. Now they have the cloud version and they deploy that as a software as a service, where you only pay for subscription to access that. So those are the examples and the advantage of cloud. Now let's compare these three models and see these uh, three service categories and see infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. Now for infrastructure as a service, this is the most flexible cloud service. By cloud service, we refer to how the services are combined together. So that's what we mean by cloud service uh, categorization, how they are combined together, those services. So here, the consumer is given the flexibility. You can configure, you can manage the hardware for your application. You can specify the server, the operating system, the choice of database. You can also specify your um, networking. So all those things, you have the flexibility to design that yourself. But for platform as a service, it focuses on application development. It's majorly used by developers or software solution companies. So the platform management is usually done by the cloud service providers. But for the software as a service, it uses pay-as-you-go pricing model. So in this case, the consumer does not provision any resources, but what the consumer does is to subscribe to those resources provided by the consumer, a uh, cloud service provider. So that's what they do. You only pay uh, through a subscription model. Now let's take a look at cloud deployment models. By cloud deployment models, we refer to how this cloud computing is delivered to the customers. So the cloud computing is delivered to the customers in four ways. One, we have the public cloud model, so based on the needs definition, the public cloud model, this refers to cloud infrastructure that is provisioned for use by the general public. So that's why we call it public cloud model. So it may be owned, managed and operated by business, academic or even government organization, but this will be based for the use of the general public. So it therefore means that so many people can subscribe to it. We call that multi-tenancy. So the cloud, the public cloud deployment model uses a multi-tenancy approach. All they need to do, example, the Azure is a cloud public um, deployment model. So every, different companies can subscribe to it. It's a multi-tenancy. You only pay for what you are provisioned within the cloud environment. And because it's a multi-tenancy, it's the cost. Uh, it gives you comparative cost advantage since it is being used by so many uh, organizations. So the cost invariably will be shared over all the customers that are using the public cloud model. What are the benefits? Easy and inexpensive setup because the provider covers the hardware. You don't need to make provision. Those are responsibilities of the providers. And the providers also make so much money. Why? Because it's multi-tenancy. The platform is to be used by different customers. Any customers that provision resources that make payment can provision resources within a cloud, uh, the public cloud environment. So that's why we refer to it as the public cloud. 
streamline and easy to provision resources. So scalability to meet customer need, you can provision, you can scale up and down. I've told you about scalability. We can have a vertical scaling or horizontal scaling as the case may be. In vertical scaling, this is where you upgrade the uh, systems or the virtual machine. Horizontal scaling, this is where you put your scaling policy to provision more resources as the demand increases. No wasted resources. You only pay for what you consume. And that is why the cloud model is more beneficial, economical when compared to the on-premises model, because this is pay as you go. This is you pay for what you've provisioned, what you've consumed. Okay, I'm, I'll look at all the questions you are dropping within the chat box as time goes on, but let me still continue, but be dropping them. I'll be checking and I'll attend to all of them uh, at the end of the day when we get to question section. But as the question is coming to you, please drop them there so you don't forget it. Just drop the questions there. I'll look at all the questions. Now let's take a look at the private cloud model. According to the NIST definition, this is a cloud model that is provisioned for the exclusive use by a single organization. Now in public cloud, that is multi-tenancy. But why will I go for a private cloud when I know it's very expensive? The only reason why we adopt the private cloud is because we want to meet regulatory requirements, compliance to regulatory requirements. In most sector, the regulators will not allow you to take critical data and provision them in a public cloud. Remember that the public cloud is used by so many people, it's multi-tenancy, multi-tenancy arrangement, which means that so many organizations can uh, subscribe to a public cloud. So as a result of that, you cannot use the public cloud to conform to regulatory requirements. But in a highly regulated environment, a sector such as the fintech and financial services, another sector like the healthcare, you cannot provision clients' data on a public cloud. In that case, you would have violated regulatory requirement. So to conform to regulatory requirement, we normally adopt the private cloud, despite the drawback that the private cloud is a bit expensive. So a private cloud is only available to an organization. It's meant for the exclusive use of that organization. It cannot be shared. But one advantage of the private cloud is that it gives you the capability to manage your resources and conform to regulatory requirements. So key benefit is increased control over data. You have control over your data governance, underlying systems and application. We can use this to uh, comply to regulatory requirement, ownership and retention of governance control. So you, nobody's sharing that um, cloud environment with you. You have absolute control. The control within the private cloud deployment is um, excellent. Nobody's sharing that with you and you can conform to regulatory requirements. Assurance over data location and removal of multiple jurisdiction legal and compliance requirement. Now, one of the major risks associated with cloud environment or cloud computing is because of the legal jurisdiction. Example, what do I mean by legal jurisdiction? Now, if, let me even see some of the participants by their name, I can know where they are from. Okay, I've seen Adebayo with Memo. All right, let me use Adebayo with Memo. I could see that name. Somebody joining from Nigeria, that's the meaning of Adebayo Wemimo. Now, let's assume that Adebayo Wemimo is the head of the IT department of an organization. And the department they are looking at outsourcing some of their uh, functions to a cloud service provider. You agree with me that Adebayo Wemimo is in Nigeria. There are regulatory requirements in the country, especially that relates to if he or she works in the financial sector, the CBN regulation will apply. And the regulations to place that you cannot keep customer's data uh, within the public cloud. So first, if he or she wants to adopt a public cloud, by the virtue of the law, she cannot adopt a public cloud. Why? In public cloud, you don't have control. It's multi-tenancy arrangement. So many, it is multi-tenant, so you have so many clients that connect or that uh, subscribe to that uh, cloud environment. So your data privacy might be eroded. Security concern might become an issue. Now, if you want to even say you want to outsource 
There are other regulatory requirements that might stipulate that the data should be within the country. So if the data should be within the country, that for means that the choice of your cloud service provider should be the one that will be within your territorial existence. So where your business, where you have presence uh, of your business, those are the cloud service providers you want to go with. But one major problem with cloud computing generally is multiple jurisdiction legal and compliance requirements. This has been an issue. Example, to, for the cloud environment to provide high availability, these data are being replicated in other data centers. Those data centers we mean by other regions. So to allow for, to provide for high availability. Now this might bring about multiple jurisdiction because if you place the data within Africa and they might be subjected to a different regulatory requirement there. So if you now replicate the data to a region like in UK, uh, European Union, they'll be subjected to the GDPR there because there are different regulatory requirements as it relates to data privacy. So these are the major concerns. Why before we adopt the cloud, we must check very well, based on the uh, regulatory requirement, are we going to go for public or private? And the other two I'm going to discuss as we continue. Or we're going to go for community, or we're going to use hybrid deployment model. So let's take a look at the hybrid cloud model. Now in hybrid cloud model, this is where we combine two or more of the cloud deployment model. We either combine the private and the public. Remember the private is for you to have, for you to be able to conform to regulatory requirements, while the public will allow you to take advantage of the cost effectiveness of the cloud. So critical resources, you deploy them within your private environment and non critical resources, you deploy them on is Galaxy Backbone in Nigeria a cloud provider? Galaxy Backbone kindly for our slides after process so we can do deeper research. Well, you have access to the recorder section so you can do a deeper research with the recorder section. If you follow the recorder section, the cloud, uh, the slide is still there on the recorder section. The, I think uh, the organizer will decide whether they'll share that with you. So I'll leave that to the organizer. But they definitely, I don't know if they'll share, but they are here, they will decide whether they'll share the recorder sections to you, which I believe they will share with you. So you'll be able to do a deeper research. Um, Maliso, you'll be able to do a deeper research. No problem about that. And um, a question came, is Galaxy Backbone in Nigeria a cloud provider? Of course, they are a cloud provider. I've just told you again, one thing you can do, Chukemeka in Ghana is this. Uh, you can go to uh, Gartner's Condrant and check um, the list of cloud service providers. The, the, the Condrant always updates new entrants into the field. But again, one thing is that there are four big players. The big players are Microsoft, uh, the second player is um, Amazon. The third is Google. <clears throat> and the fourth one is Alibaba. Then we have others. I classify them to be others. Then you have Oracle, you have HP, you have Rack Center, and you have others coming up. They are all there. I classify them to be others because um, why do I say the big four? The big four, they have a robust, um, they are widely accepted. They are part of the leaders. If you go to Condrant, uh, Gartner's Condrant, you see these big four as the leaders in the market. They dominated the market. They are well accepted. They are what are being deployed by most organizations. I'm not saying others are not being used, but these are widely used by different organizations in different continents. That's why they are the big four. They are the leaders in the market. Then, okay, a question again, does saving data on the cloud significantly reduce the need for cyber security measures on the company? It does not reduce, we'll get there. It doesn't reduce it. Techno C18, it doesn't reduce it. There are two things a company must do before they adopt the cloud. A company must do what we call due diligence. Uh, due diligence means you must take, um, uh, due, by due diligence, it means that you must have a comprehensive risk analysis to know whether the cloud is actually ideal for you. By risk analysis means that you take a look at your regulatory requirement and see if the regulatory requirement will prohibit you from adopting the cloud. And if they allow you to even adopt the cloud, which of the cloud model will you adopt? Will it be private? Will it be public? Will it be hybrid? So will it be community 
All these are what organization must do, due diligence. Uh, so when you do your due diligence, there's another thing I'm going to discuss, which is very vital after this. Shortly, I'm going to go in there now. We have what we call the shared responsibility model in the cloud. When people adopt the cloud, they feel that, oh, all my security responsibility, I'm bouncing it back to the cloud service provider. It is absolutely not correct because the way the cloud is designed, I'll get there very soon, you see it in all these models, be it infrastructure as a service or platform as a service or software as a service, there are responsibilities expected of the cloud consumer. So as an organization that adopted the cloud, there are responsibilities expected of you. I'll show you in the next um, three slides. So just uh, hold on a little bit. So um, I think those are the concerns here. Let me continue. So I'll be looking at it so that I won't bore you with my a webinar, I'll be looking at the questions, uh, quickly move into the question and come back. Now, when we take a look at hybrid, hybrid means you combine two of the cloud deployment model, either you combine the private or public. Now, why will you need to combine these? The private is exclusively for you to conform to regulatory requirements, but the public, you want to take advantage of the cost, cost effectiveness of the public. So an enterprise might decide to use an hybrid where critical applications are placed within the private um, cloud and non-critical applications are placed on the public um, cloud to take advantage of the cost um, optimization there. So that's the reason you might want to go for hybrid. And most multinationals, they use hybrid deployment model due to the high cost of private um, deployment model. Now we have again key benefits, retain ownership and oversight of critical tax. So the critical tax are placed within the private cloud. So you place them on the private cloud, those critical tax, that's where you place them to take advantage of it. And then, okay, let me see. We have the big four cloud providers, but every presentation is always about AWS, Web, can you explain? All right. Okay, Chuke Maker, Jenny. Um, you are calling, you are asking me this question in Nigeria. You see, in Nigeria, where I evolved from, um, AWS has a lot of presence there. So because they have a lot of presence, so they have a lot of webinars, they have a lot of uh, workshop, and there's a group that we all belong to where they promote AWS uh, vigorously. But when we talk about the big four, the big four, Go to Gartner's Condrent. The big four refers to the market leaders. The market leaders are Microsoft, they are Amazon. Amazon means AWS and Google and then Alibaba. If, if one is not careful, you think that Alibaba don't exist. But if you go to Asia countries within the, uh, their continent, Alibaba cloud is very, very popular even then Microsoft and AWS. So all these things are regional based and how it is being promoted across regions. But if you even look at it, in Nigeria, where we are from, uh, the two or the three major cloud adopted, uh, you have AWS, you have Microsoft, and you have Google being adopted. So one of the example of Google is Google Mails. So people use either Microsoft Office 365 uh, 365, or they use Google. So that's why they, they seem to resonate more. But Amazon is trying to get into the market too in, in Nigeria. So they have a lot of presence, a lot of webinars, a lot of workshop. That's uh, why you are having more of their presence. I hope that answers your question, Chuke Mika Jenny. All right, so, um, all right, you're welcome. So now, retain ownership and oversight of critical tax. So when you want to retain ownership for compliance, you put that on the private cloud. Then control the most critical business components and systems. So enhance. So this just, uh, the hybrid is just to give you two things. You want to take advantage of cost, and you also want to be on the side of the regulators to comply with the regulatory requirements. So that's how, why you adopt the hybrid cloud model. Now, for time's sake, let me quickly move at a speed, but I still want to make sure that we understood what I'm saying. All these are still fundamentals. Now, let's take a look at this aspect, the last aspect, and go to the webinar proper. For the community cloud, 
based on the needs definition, this is for exclusive use by a specific community of consumers. Uh, these consumers, they have a common concern that we call a shared concern. These consumer might have the same security requirement or policy or compliance consideration. So in this case, we call them community. Okay, I'll do that. I'll do that shortly. Um, before I finish, I'll do that. So now, for this community cloud, example in Nigeria, we have um, the needs, uh, we have um, this intersettlement bank. Uh, what do we even call them? I've forgotten now, I just wanted to remember. Uh, they used to be on VI. Uh, I remember, I remember very soon. So, what they do, they can have a common platform where all the banks will hook up to. That's a community cloud model. In an institution of learning, a university system might also deploy a community cloud model. Okay, I think somebody is telling me. Okay, NIPS, yes. Uh -huh. Yes, thank you so much. That's NIPS. So um, in a uh, institution of learning, you might have a university can deploy a community model where all the various colleges might hook up to. So community cloud deployment is used when you have the same security requirement or policy or compliance consideration. So that's um, for that. Now let's move into the cost proper. What is the benefit of this? Cost-effective multi-tenancy. You know, in community cloud, so many people are sharing their resources. So when you want to maintain that um, cloud environment, the cost is shared among all the members. Two, high levels of privacy, security, and regulatory compliance because they have a shared common um, security concern, like the NIPS. Now, NIPS creates a common platform for all the banks in Nigeria to um, assess. So that's an example of uh, community cloud too. Now, let's take a look at cloud share responsibility model. This is where the webinar to me actually begins from. All the ones I've said all the while is just to give you an intro to whet your appetite to why we're here. So one big mistake that most organizations they do make is that they fail to do due diligence before adopting the cloud model. And because they fail to do a due diligence, they don't even know which of them they will adopt. They don't know whether they will go for infrastructure as a service, or they will go for platform as a service, or they will, they will go for software as a service. That's one. Two, the deployment model, they are not even sure whether they should go for private cloud deployment or public, or they should use an hybrid, or they should adopt community. The cloud is based on shared responsibility model. This responsibility of security is shared between the cloud service providers and the cloud consumer. So the moment you adopt the cloud, you don't assume that the service provider will protect all the resources for you. It is not so. That's not the way the cloud was developed. The cloud was developed based on shared responsibility between two parties, the provider and the consumer. And this depends on the cloud service categories. Example, if you look at on-prem, in on-prem, where we are coming from, the conventional on-prem, we are responsible for everything. We are responsible for the information data. We are responsible for the devices connected, the identities, the login, applications that we deploy within our own premises, how to protect them, the network control, the operating systems, the patching and um, uh, updating of the upgrading of the operating system, all the physical hosts we are concerned, the physical network and the physical data center. It's our responsibility as an enterprise to protect that. Now, when you move to the cloud in infrastructure as a service, don't forget under infrastructure as a service, this is where the consumer is given the flexibility to provision the servers, to, to provision the operating system, to provision the network, to provision the application. So the rule of the thumb in the cloud is that whatsoever you have provisioned, you'll be responsible for the protection. So in infrastructure as a service, because of the flexibility given to the consumer, whatsoever the consumer has provisioned they will be responsible for the protection of it. So if I provision a server, I'll be the one that will protect it. The responsibility of the service providers is to protect the underlying data center. The security of the data center is their own responsibility. 
They are not concerned about protecting the operating system, saying that the operating system is patched is none of their concern. The uh, service, uh, service pack you install is not their concern, is not part of their purview. So when you're adopting infrastructure as a service, and I told you infrastructure as a service is ideal when you are migrating your own premises infrastructure to the cloud. So when you are doing that, you are using infrastructure as a service. But as you're doing that, everything you've deployed to the cloud, you'll be responsible for the protection of it. That's one. Two, in platform as a service, you recall with me, I said, this is applicable to developers. So software developing companies or solution providers, they adopt this. Now, whatsoever they provided, the provision within the platform, the cloud service providers, they'll be responsible for the protection of it. Don't forget in platform as a service, they only provision application. So because the provision application, they'll be responsible for the management of who will have access to the application, the devices that will be connected to the application, and the information and data that the application produces. So it is the function of the cloud service provider to work on the OS. Don't forget the operating system, the underlying platform is the responsibility of the service provider. So the service providers under this will take that responsibility. The patching, the updating, the licensing of the operating system will be a core responsibility of the cloud service provider. Now in software as a service, the consumer does not provision anything. All we do is to subscribe. Example, Zoom, we didn't provision anything, we only subscribe for the service. So all the underlying infrastructure, the application, the networking operating system will be the responsibility of the cloud service provider. The only function of the cloud consumer is their information and data. So regardless of, and the devices connected to it and how you identify them. So regardless of the uh, cloud categories, it is the responsibility of the cloud service provider to always protect their information and data, regardless whether infrastructure as a service, whether platform, whether software as a service, you must protect your information and data. Now that takes us to data privacy. By data privacy, we refer to the protection of personal identifiable information from unauthorized use, unauthorized access, and unauthorized modification. So part of the importance of data privacy is the protection of sensitive information. And when we talk about PII, uh, personal identifiable information, this refers to information that could be used to identify a natural person. Those information include their name, their social security number, their phone number, their email address, their demography that you can use to identify them. Two, the data privacy is very important when you want to conform to legal and regulatory compliance. Example, in Nigeria now, we even have a bureau for data privacy. An agency has been set up for data privacy. It used to be the function of NIDA, but an agency has been set up for implementation of it. And that agency, if you are conversant with GDPR, I think in the next uh, webinar, when we want to take a look at another webinar, we'll take a look at data privacy and regulatory and um, global regulations. So we'll look at data privacy and global regulations. So we'll be taking a look at data privacy within the context uh, of global regulations. And when we look at these global regulations, we'll consider GDPR. Now for GDPR, the GDPR talks about this um, compliance. And um, if you want to conform to the GDPR, uh, Article 45, Article 5 of it, Article 6 of it, Article 7, Article 9 and 10, but let me just extract Article 9. In Article 5, let me start with Article 5. Article 5 talks about the processing, the principles of data processing. Example, when someone wants to collect information from you, uh, the information should be limited. The purpose of the information should be defined. So when you go to some website, they'll tell you, we need to collect this for this certain purpose. They will tell you also the retention period of that um, data they want to collect from you. And again, if they need to retain the data longer than what was informed to you, they will they need to write to you and tell you, oh, we need your consent because Article 6 talk about lawful processing of data. And before you can lawfully process data of individual, 
The first thing is their consent. You need their consent. This consent can be obtained by when you go to a website, they'll tell you, read our data uh, privacy policy. If you agree with that, please just click this check. By clicking that check, you've consented to the data privacy rules there. So it's a way to conform to legal and regulatory requirements. Um, so that's one. There are so many regulatory requirements. The most pronounced one has been the one within the European Union, the GDPR. Uh, in the um, US, we have all so many sector-based privacy requirements. We have the um, HI, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA. We have this. We have this. We have um, the Sabanese Osley. We have the Grand Blish Act. So Sabanese Osley is for publicly traded organization. Grand Blish Act has to do with financial records. All these are sector-based regulatory requirements. In most countries of the world, like in Nigeria, we have our own version of the GDPR. In other African countries, we have, and in UK, we have the DPA, Data Protection Act. So all these are regulatory compliance. So the importance of data privacy is actually to conform to the legal and regulatory compliance. Then also to bring about customer trust and confidence. Now, when we talk about customer trust and confidence, if you have seen the impact of data breach and the impact it has on the reputation of organization in terms of their market share and reputation, you come to understand that protecting this data is of great importance for you to remain in business. The business continuity and resilience, your data backup, your disaster recovery planning, these, um, these are classical example of data privacy, how important it is, especially when there are disaster, how do you ensure that your, those data are protected and the business can continue to function in the event of those disaster. The mitigation of data breach risks, which are going to take a look at as um, we continue, but I'm going to be fast at some point, I'll spend an hour. So now let's take a look at examples of um, data breach. There are so many examples, but I just decided to pick about five of them. Uh, and all these five, I picked them because of the peculiarity. Uh, one example is the Capital One in 2019. Uh, a good, why is this so important? Because the data breach was done by a former employee of the cloud service provider who has access, unauthorized access to the customer data stored in the cloud. So when customers, when your employee, internal staff, you recall with me that when we talk about threats, the, ma the major threat that organization is faced with is actually internal uh, insider threats. Insider threats are uh, threats posed by your former employee or disgruntled employee that understand the architecture of your network and could now use those uh, knowledge to cause havoc. Uh, on the network. So the former employee gained unauthorized access to the customer data stored in the cloud. And this led to about 106 million um, personal information of customers being exposed. And what does this mean? This means that it shows the importance of robust access control and monitoring in cloud environment. The fact that we've deployed our resources to the cloud does not mean that, like I told you in the share responsibility model, the share responsibility model is a responsibility between the cloud provider and the cloud consumer. You can adopt the cloud truly, but if you don't do due diligence on your risk assessment to know which of the assets are so will be at risk and then put appropriate controls around them, this could lead to data breach and the organization can be fine. If you take a look at the GDPR, Article 33, specify about notification of breach. And this notification of breach stipulates that once there is a breach, the enterprise must notify the supervising authority. The supervising authority means the regulators, and also you notify the data subject. By data subject, we mean those individuals that the, uh, the personal identifiable information has been breached. And you know, once you announce anything that you have been breached or it comes to the public knowledge, you know, that will affect the reputation of the enterprise and also the market share of that enterprise. So it's very important that we put in place a, a, a very comprehensive access control and monitoring within the cloud environment once we adopt the cloud. Now, if you look at Equifax in 2017, now the 
the breach here was as a result of vulnerability in an open source software component used in the cloud-based system. So as a result of this vulnerability, about 147 million of consumer financial information were exposed. And as a result of that, it therefore means that, uh, what is the lesson learned here? It means vulnerability assessment and patch management is very important in cloud environment. Aside from the control and monitoring, vulnerability assessment and patch management is also very important that we need to pay attention to. Number three, Dropbox 2012. Of course, we know Dropbox to be a cloud storage provider. But as a result of a breach that exposed the email address and password of uh, 68 million users, and this breach was made possible due to the compromise of a Dropbox employee's account, which allowed the attackers to access user data. Now, what does this entails? The attacker were able to compromise the user data as a result of the fact that they use a social engineering techniques. And how do we defeat social engineering techniques? We need to use strong authentication mechanisms and we emphasize more on user training, employee training. Most enterprises don't invest money on training. You must expand a lot of money, budget money for security awareness and education. And it has to be continuous. I like what the banks are doing. The banks will use all the medium, all the channels of communication. When you say regulators, do you mean government? Yes. Okay, when I say regulators, okay. Regulators refers to the agency of government within the context of where you are asking me the question. You have the CBN. If you go to the CBN website, you can download IT roadmap for bank. The CBN IT roadmap for banks, you see the regulations there. You can consult page 75 of that document when you download it, or you, consult, or you check page 77 because the document has been updated. The updated one is 96 pages. If you downloaded the 96 pages updated document, you go to page 77 of it. But if you downloaded the, if you're able to download the old one, which is uh, 91, you go to page 75 of it. You see, I, the document is called CBN IT Roadmaps, IT Roadmap for Banks, that's one. Two, there's another document by CBN. It's called CBN Cyber Security Framework for Banks. The CBN Cyber Security Framework for Banks, you see it. And you can also go to NIDA website and see NIDA regulations when it comes to data privacy. And also the new agency of government, uh, Privacy Bureau, you can go to that website and also check the regulations as it relates to data privacy. So when I use regulators, I mean agency of government, the statutory law put in place to guide the operations of every enterprise, depending on the sector where you operate from. If you are in telecoms, you'll be looking at um, regulations from NCC, uh, depending on your country. So um, in UK here, you have your DPA, your DPA is Data Privacy um, Act, and you also have other regulations of government, which you go to the site to see what the law expects you to have. All right, then for FinTech and financial sector, you have the PCI DSS, payment card. You have the payment card, industry data security standard, the PCI DSS. This is a sector-based regulation that enterprise that stores or process card order information must confirm to. So now, based on what I was saying for Dropbox, uh, we need to expand more uh, allocation should be given to training, training, especially tra uh, security awareness, training and education. This is very necessary to avert most of this social engineering attack. And like I was saying, the banks are very good at that. They use all the medium of communication to ensure that they drive home their point on how to convey this security awareness education. Then we have the AWS SD bucket misconfiguration attack. And this led to most of the private data stored in the cloud to be exposed to the hands of uh, the attackers. Um, this include Verizon, uh, Joe's and Accenture. They were affected due to this misconfiguration of um, S3 buckets. The S3 bucket is the storage um, services in AWS. And based on this, 
This also allows the importance of properly configuring access controls and regularly reviewing cloud storage settings. So when the cloud storage settings is poorly configured and you don't regularly review it, it can also lead to an exposure um, breach of data, which can have reputational effect, and in most cases, lawsuits to the enterprise and may affect their market share. So we have the Marriott International, the Marriott International Global Hotel Chain. Um, the impact led to about 500 million guests' um, account, personal identifiable account being exposed. Now, what led to this was because Marriott actually acquired two other hotels, the Starwood and the Resort Worldwide. So when they acquired that, the attacker had unauthorized access to customer data, including personal information, passport details, and payment card information. So based on that, it therefore means that before we go for acquisition, margin and acquisition, a thorough due diligence should be embarked on by every enterprise to look at the risk assessment before you acquire any organization. Now, data privacy threats. I'm quickly going to run through this. I'm looking at my time too. I don't want to bore you. But I can take questions while I'm still running through. I can take questions, digress a little to questions. So we have the database system vulnerability, insecure interface and APIs. We have account hijacking. Some of these data breach threats are peculiar to cloud and some are generic. They're not peculiar to cloud. They're also, uh, they also affect on-premises. We have the insufficient uh, due diligence, weak authentication, data location and distribution. We have data management outsourcing. So I'll quickly take a few of them and move to uh, the last phase of uh, the webinar. So when we talk about data breach, these are incidents that impact on your data. And this incident will lead to unauthorized exposure of sensitive data to um, individuals that are not meant to even have access to those data. So in this, if you want to prevent data breach, there are controls you can put in place. Some of the controls might be your encryption. So regardless of the state of data, you must ensure that this data is encrypted. We look at the state of data. When the data is at rest, the encryption, you must encrypt it. When data is in use, as, uh, maybe when you are viewing the data, you are processing the data, you must also encrypt it. When the data is in transit, when you are moving the data from one location to another, you must also encrypt the data using your TLS or using a VPN solution uh, to have an encrypted tunnel. So you need to do that. Then system vulnerabilities. I think I have a question from someone. Okay, no, no question. Let me continue. Now for system vulnerabilities, the system vulnerabilities that are present in underlying systems such as the operating systems can also expose, uh, can lead to exposure of your data and put the data at risk. So we must ensure that these systems, they're actually being patched. You patch the systems continually. And also uh, aside from patching the system, you also do a lot of system monitoring. You monitor them and you perform your vulnerability assessment and pen testing on the underlying infrastructure to prevent your data from being exposed. Now, this insecure interface and API, this is peculiar to cloud only because most of the functions you have within the cloud, your auto scaling, your provisioning, all these functions depends on APIs, application programming interface. So when you have an insecure interface, this could lead to your data being breached. So one of the things you do is that you must embark on security testing, your dynamic application security testing, your dynamic application security testing, you must embark on them, is very important. You embark on them is very important. You can also do the static application security testing. Probability scan, scanning will be your verb, then pen testing. All these are the tests you do to prevent insecure interface or API. Then the encryption is also important and authorization access to the API. So you ensure that access is granted based on need to know but need to know concept will mean before you grant access, there must be a business justification before you grant access. And then when you even grant access, you must give the user least privileges. You don't give users too much privileges. You only assign them the privileges they need to perform the work. You don't give them excessive privilege. Account hijacking, this is not unique to the cloud. It's peculiar to uh, whether on-premises or cloud. So what do you do now? Uh, how do you com uh, combat this? Multi-factor authentication and strong authentication will be a very good way to uh, prevent this. But you see, most enterprises are caught in the web. 
they are caught in the web of efficient logging and then putting in place um, a robust authentication platform. Most organizations now adopt single sign-on technology, the SSO. The single sign-on technology is good, no doubt about that. But you must do a risk assessment to know which application can you allow single sign-on on. Because in the single sign-on technology, this is where the um, user log on to the enterprise and have access to other resources. So you only log in once and have access to other resources, which therefore means that if the account is compromised, the attacker will also have access to all the other resources you have access to. So for critical application, when you do your risk assessment, those critical applications, you might need to put in place a second layer of authentication. When the application is so critical, you don't allow because, okay, I've just come into the network, I log into my workstation, then I have access to all the application. No, you do your risk assessment. If those applications are actually um, high risk application, then before I assess it, I must have another level of authentication to the application. So there are so many things you can use. You can use a token, token login so that uh, you avoid replay attack. It's very important to that. Then you have the malicious insider. The malicious insider is of great concern in a cloud environment, especially when this malicious insider is an employee of the cloud service provider. You remember I told you that the cloud service provider, their function is to protect the underlying infrastructure. So if you have a disgruntled employee of the cloud service uh, provider and uh, this person have unauthorized access to most of the resources there, then it becomes a big concern. And these cut across whether infrastructure as a service, platform as a service or software as a service model. What is the difference between the account hijacking and ransomware? <clears throat> now, account hijacking and ransomware, we use them synonymously. And let me add another term to the ransomware. The ransomware, I normally refer to it as the computer kidnapping. Because in this, somebody sees or prevents you from accessing your resources. And before you can be granted access to it, you are asked to pay a token. So that's a form of kidnapping, but the kidnapping in this case is um, you, your digital asset is being taken off you. You don't have undue access to it, except you, you part away with some money. So account hijacking and ransomware is used synonymously, but um, we use them within the context of the fact that in, in, the, uh, in ransomware, the intent is for monetary gain. In account hijacking, the intent of the intruder might just be for uh, for the fun of it, just to show you that um, they can deface or they can disrupt your activities. But ransomware, the, uh, the, the, the outcome or the motive is monetary gain. All right, so please let your question be coming in so that um, we can do the two at the same time, not to bore you. All right, so we have advanced persistent threat, APT. This APT, this is a threat such that the attacker wants to establish themselves and steal data over a long term. So for advanced persistent threat, the attacker might use all the techniques they have to ensure they gain access to your network and they can remain there as long as they want. They cover their tracks. You might not know that they're there. All they're waiting for is one, um, they're waiting for the right time to hit the network. Uh, they can even plant a logic bomb. The logic bomb, these are, these are malicious code that is being triggered by events. So they are event triggered. So at a certain event, maybe they are trying to observe if a certain money will move into a certain account and they, they've had a, a wind of it that, okay, there's a big transaction coming in, the money will be coming into that account. So they can just gain access and establish themselves within the environment such that you, they will not be noticed, they will clear the tracks. And when the right time comes, um, based on the event, then they can launch attack on the network. So this is an attack that is very difficult to detect because in advanced persistent threats, they establish themselves. They can even have, um, they can gain what you call a privilege escalation. So they come in with a user account, promote the user account to become an administrative account. And so they have all the assets that the administrator will have so that's why it's so difficult to uh, detect. 
But one of the ways we can mitigate this is that at the point you are engaging, you can do what's called human security. At the, recruitment, at the recruitment point, you ensure that you employ the right people, you do a background check, and the background check should not be one off. The background check should be done continually based on the role that's been performed by such individual. When you do, it's possible that at the point of engagement, the person have a good character, but over time, the behavior might have changed. So there's a need for enterprise to continually indulge in um, due diligence, checking, uh, checking the behavior um, of every individual, of every employee, depending on the sensitive position that they occupy within the enterprise. Then data loss. Data loss is quite different from data breach. Data loss refers to the loss of information when you can no longer have access to the decryption key. In most cases, when you deploy your data in the cloud environment, these data are actually being encrypted. And for you to decrypt the data, you need your decryption key. But when you don't have access to this key, maybe the key is being lost, then that will lead to data loss. So data loss, it means you are no longer able to access those data as a result of the fact that you don't have access to the decryption key. That could lead to data loss. Then we have the insufficient due diligence. This should be done before you adopt the cloud. Your due diligence, you assess your risks, know the type of cloud adoption you want to take, know the type of uh, cloud uh, service category you want to adopt. So when you do your due diligence, you'll be able to put in place due care. Due care simply means putting the appropriate controls to safeguard your information assets after you have done your due diligence. Then weak authentication. A weak authentication can also lead to data being compromised. One of the ways you can prevent that is to use multi-factor authentication within the network. Okay, okay, all right. I'll take notes. So one of the things you can do, uh, one of the things you can do is to ensure strong authentication. And in authentication, uh, there are three types of authentication. We have type one, type two, and type three. Type one means something you know, like your password. In type two authentication, this refers to something you have, like a token. And in type three, something you are, biometric. So you combine these two, any of these two together. Each of them is called single factor authentication. So depending on how secure the environment is, you must ensure that you use two factor authentication. All right, so let me take questions. I've talked about data allocation and distribution. Let me skip all those things I'm sourcing. Now, <clears throat> we're moving to the last part of it. Data privacy countermeasures. What are the countermeasures we can adopt? We can use the encryption techniques, that's one. Access control and authentication, I've talked about that. Then I'll take a look at secure data deletion, privacy enhanced technology, compliance with data protection regulations, they are very important. So for encryption techniques, regardless of the state of data, whether the data is at rest, you need to encrypt it. And the best way you can encrypt data at rest is to use advanced encryption standard. This is symmetric encryption. When the data is in transit, you can use the TLS. Don't use SSL. SSL is outdated, so use TLS. And also you can use homomorphic encryption. What is homomorphic encryption? Homomorphic encryption is a technique where it allows us to work on encrypted data without decrypting it. So when the data is encrypted, you can actually work on those encrypted data. That's another, the latest data encryption, uh, lat latest data privacy um, techniques, homomorphic encryption. So you don't even need to decrypt the data. Once the data is encrypted, you can continually work on those encrypted data as if they're decrypted. Now two, you use access control and authentication. The multi-factor have explained that. And you can also use role-based access control where access is granted based on the roles of individuals. There are so many access control models. We have the RBAC, we have the mandatory access control, we have the discretionary access control. But for data privacy countermeasures, you must adopt the role-based access control. Now for secure data deletion, we have data sanitization and crypto shredding. Within the cloud environment, we don't use this data sanitization. We don't use discussing as a method of data sanitization. What we use is crypto shredding. And what is crypto shredding all about? 
Remember I told you that data, when you are putting your data in the cloud, you must encrypt it. So, and you need to decrypt the data with a decryption key. So in cryptographic erasure, this is where we simply destroy the decryption key that will be used to decrypt that encrypted data. So once you destroy that decryption key, it therefore means that the data will be rendered useless. Nobody will be able to decrypt it. That's called crypto shredding. So we can use privacy enhanced technology like anonymization techniques. In most of the financial sectors, you see when they send our bank details to us, the middle letters are often marked. So this is an anonymization technique. This is used to prevent um, the person identifiable information from being uh, seen such that you cannot use it to identify individuals. So they max it. So they max some certain characters. But in differential privacy, differential privacy is very important when you are analyzing or sharing data. So when you want to share the data, when the data is in use, we use the differential privacy techniques where they had a layer of noise or randomness value to the data to protect individual privacy. So they just pad the data with some certain uh, random values to ensure that the data cannot be used to identify individuals. Then compliance with um, data protection regulations. You have your GDPR, you have the California Consumer Privacy Act in the United States. You have the Personal Data Protection Act in Singapore. You have the Data Protection Act in UK. Those are some of the things you can do. Then what are the best practices we can use for ensuring data privacy? First, conducting regular risk assessment. So your due diligence is very important. Implementing a strong security policy, that's also good. Uh, training, you, uh, the, the importance of training can long be emphasized. Uh, so training is very key to all the staff that handles the data. Monitoring and auditing cloud services and then regularly updating security measures. So those are very key. Now, when you conduct regular risk assessments, you need to identify the threats. You need to identify the uh, vulnerabilities to the data privacy. You need to also assess the uh, effectiveness of the security controls around your data and put in place um, uh, countermeasures or compensating control if the existing controls are not effective. You also need to be proactive in identifying emerging threats and evolving security risks. So you need to keep yourself abreast of the latest um, security information and also know how to do a risk assessment on your own data and quickly protect it. Ensure compliance with data protection regulations and industry standard is very important. They're implementing a strong security policy. So your policy, policy drives the way the data are being implemented. So key elements of your policy to include roles and responsibilities. You must define that. The data has to be classified because if you don't classify the data, you'll not be able to put appropriate control over them. The strong password, you must identify your password and authentication requirements in your policies. And then you must also define how regular updates should be done and patch management. You also must take into consideration monitoring as an assessment of your controls. The fact that you have controls in place does not mean they may be effective. You need to assess them, you need to audit them, and then you also need to do a third party risk management and due diligence. So training is very important. You train employees on data privacy. You train them on policies, procedures, and best practice is very important. Handling and safeguarding of sensitive data, they must also be given training on that. And you must also train them such that they should be able to recognize and report security incidents or any suspicious activities that relates to your data. And you train them on how they can comply with data privacy regulations and industry uh, standard. And this training should be ongoing. You train them on emerging threats and involving privacy challenges. All the training should be given to them. Monitoring and auditing is very important. You conduct your risk assessment, you do your regular audit, you analyze your log, reviewing access logs, then your intrusion prevention system, your ideas, all those things, you should review them. And you must implement real-time alert and response mechanism for potential threat. So lastly, regularly updating security measures, you must conduct your VAPT, vulnerability assessment and pen testing, should be done. And when you do all these, you must keep software operating systems and application up to date 
with the latest security patches. They are very important. All these are the best practices you can use for ensuring your data privacy. So with this, let me take your questions quickly. Let me take your question. I know I've taken a lot of your time. Sorry about that. I was trying to ensure that I... So let me take your questions quickly. Anisha. Yeah, hi. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask uh, Mr. Salami the questions or you can put in the chat box. Uh, you can actually unmute yourself and ask questions. Hello, good evening. Can you yes. hear me, Mr. Salami? Yes, I can hear you. Good evening. How are you? I'm fine. My name is Larry Akobi. I'm calling from Nigeria. All right, Mr. Larry. I still remember. <laughs> I remember <Okay>. you now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for the sake of some of us who are who intend to switch to tech base from accounting background. Okay. I think I think it will be of you if you can have your uh, WhatsApp number so that we can we can serve you can help us as a mentor so that we can easily release to you ask ask questions or something like that because this was uh, present is so wonderful. It's so rich, it's so uh, enticing that one need to give attention to. But nonetheless, along the line, one might uh, 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 have some issues to want to clear. I think it would be better if we can have access to your WhatsApp number so that we can easily reach you, so that you can serve, you can help us as a, as a mentor. Okay, that's not a challenge, but you can always reach me on LinkedIn. If you go to my LinkedIn, just type okay. my name, Salami Olusheson Adejoye. My LinkedIn, okay. you join me on LinkedIn and you see my contact on LinkedIn. Just go to contact, you see my uh, okay. my number there. Okay, okay, okay. Salami Olusheson Adejoye. Once you send the connection okay. request, I'll join, I'll accept you. you go to contact, okay. you pick my um, okay. phone number there. My UK okay. number is there. And okay. that UK number is also a WhatsApp number. Okay, that's good. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So, uh, hey, my second question. Can you hear me? I'm with you. This is C I P P C C I S S P. Okay, certified information system security professional. <laughs> yes. So the 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 marketer that is top marketing is said. The exam is a uh, is not mandatory. That word not my mandatory. I'm confused. I can I, I can use this sort a training or sort a wonderful course without doing the exam and guess and being satisfied. Because okay. in Nigeria, yeah, yes, in I Nigeria, understand. We, we 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 carry the certificate so much. So if ordinarily I just have uh, the training. Would that be satisfied? Who, who will take me or who will employ me based on that? Okay, Mr. Thing. Larry, let me quickly attend to that. Mr. Chukwemeka, just give me a minute. Let me attend to Mr. Larry. I know you've been raising okay. your hand. Mr. Larry, I, first, I must appreciate you for your thoughtfulness to switch over to cybersecurity. And I'm happy you have a very good knowledge of um, accounting. You've sent a voice note to me before. And I've also done due diligence on you to find out more about you on the on the social presence. Now, like I told you, I compare this with the accounting profession. In the accounting okay. profession, back then in Nigeria, we have ICANN. And ICANN, yes. they do exam three times in a year. And these yes. three times in a year, they are mandatory. So, which means that if you must write ICANN, you either present yourself in May or September or, this, or November diet. Am I right? Yes. But yes. for CISSP, it gives you flexibility. Okay. You will decide when you want to write. That's what they mean by not mandatory. So mandatory. I can decide to write any time. Any time. That's the flexibility. Okay. Uh -huh. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm cleared now. All right. I'm cleared now. I'm cleared now. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Can I come in? Yes, Mr. Chukwe Mega. Okay. Over to you. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I must thank you. The the presentation was very educative, thank and you. I have learned a thing or two. 
Uh, my question is still on that issue of cybersecurity. I work okay. with uh, I work with the Nigerian Copyright Commission, and we investigate online uh, piracy. So that actually um, raised my interest in cybersecurity. Then I I have also I have also um, um, taken note of that CISSP. Okay. And my question now: If Edubex trains me. Can I, uh, just like uh, the other guy asked, taking the exam is not actually mandatory. Can I use the knowledge gained to get any remote job? As you mean, you have trained me on, um, you know, uh, CISSP. Okay. What will, be, what will be the value of that knowledge gained before I now take the certification uh, exam proper? Can okay. you understand? I get you, Mr. Chuke. Yes. yes, thank you. You see, you, sir. first, what... In global practice, if you want a remote job, the first thing they ask for is the skills. Then they will now put a coverage. CISSP certification is desirable, which means if I have four candidates that are head to head and they both have a skills in CISSP, which is cybersecurity, and I need to pick one candidate if the position is just for one candidate. And the policy of the enterprise says that we must go for someone that had the skills, that's one, and preferably someone that maybe in the next three months, they will always write it there, who like to have the certification or has gotten the certification. You know, we'll likely go for those ones that will say either out of the four, if none of them has the certification, anyone that says, okay, in the next three months, they want to pursue the certification, that's the person we'll go for. Is that not right? Exactly, yeah, correct. Okay. Now, to buttress my point, because you are in my country, you can go to the CBN Cybersecurity Framework for Bank. Once okay. you go online, just say CBN Cybersecurity Framework for Banks and go to page three and page four of it. Now you have my contact just tell me what you see there. CBN mandates and specify the qualification of the will-be CISO in a bank. And one of the requirements is that they put it, you must have it, not desire it. You must have CISSP, that's Certified Information Security System Professional, and you must have a CISM, Certified Information Security Manager. In addition to that, you must have a Master's in Cybersecurity. Now, again, there's a caveat in that where the banks are flexible. They will tell you if you have the skills, no problem. But you must show us that in the next six months at most, you should have these credentials. So that when they are coming with their audit and they say, okay, who is your CISO? What's the qualification? Oh, he has the skills. Okay, what is the evidence? The evidence to show that you have the skills is the certification. It's just a validation of those skills. And when you want to compete globally, you must validate your skills. But skills take precedence. But validation of those skills is where the certification comes in. Because you want to compete globally, not locally, again. Hope that is taken, Mr. Emeka. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Flambe, come, Flamb come back. Come again with uh, that CBN. OK, CBN. I, said, I said, go online. Download the okay. CBN Cybersecurity Frameworks for banks. When you download oh, it, CBN oh. Cybersecurity oh. Frameworks for banks, go to page yeah. three and page four of that document. You will see the requirement of a CISO. And you can always share your thoughts with me through my WhatsApp, which is available on the LinkedIn if you connect to my name. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you, sir. You're most welcome, Mr. Chuke Maker. So, any other question, Anissa? Uh, any other questions, if you have? Um, meanwhile, I'll just put the Google Form link in the chat box so that you can fill in so that our team can get in touch with you. Exactly. exactly. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm just putting the Google Form so that you can... Um, uh, I think, uh, Salami, you need to make me the host back. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you so much for that. So I'm just putting the Google form link in okay. the chat box. You can fill in 
this google form so that our team can be in contact with you uh, any more questions if not like uh, we can wind up because i know that it's uh, too uh, late for everyone so once again i'm just putting this google form in the chat box you can fill in and i would like to thank each one of you especially mr salami for your insightful webinar and uh, each one of you to participate and ask for the questions asking questions and of course uh, our team as well thank you all thank you so much have a good night thank you so much all thanks thank for you. joining the webinar to see you in subsequent thank you webinar you. thank you very much do have a blessed night and you too bye